Hey everyone, it's Horror Free For All, and today I'm bringing you a discussion video talking about short stories that I would love to see the Creepshow television series adapt. Now, to put it up front, first and foremost, I'm only one person. I haven't read every single short story anthology collection. I haven't read every single recommendation possible on the internet or heard of X story, Y story, Z story. If you feel like there's a story that I didn't mention that you would like to see adapted, leave it down in the comment section. I open this as a open floor discussion for this topic only because I don't really see much people besides one Reddit poster and one person who has a blog talking about this. And I think it's fascinating. Now some people might be kind of taken back by this realization, but the Creepshow television series, at least with season one in the specials between season one and season two, in scattershot in the in you know the past two seasons, right, have taken short stories that were published in anthology collections from X amount of years past and have put them into the television series. Now, in my opinion, <clears throat> there's a lot of stories out there, uh, and I'm not trying to take anything away from these writers writing treatments specifically for the show these days. I think that's what they've been doing for the most part for the past three seasons now. Season four's trailer just dropped the day I'm making this video. So it, that's just how it comes across. And I'm not saying that that's an issue whatsoever. I'm just saying that if you wanted to pick some stories, producers, creators, if you want to, if you stumble across this video, please, by all means, take my recommendations. Some of these are very old. <laughs> Uh, maybe going back almost 100 years plus. Some of these are newer. Um, if that's, you know, consternation, so be it. Uh, but these are just stories that I've accumulated with discussions from people, from, you know, finding out about them, reading them myself, thinking that these would be great, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I collected about 12, so I made like a full season's worth. <laughs> so I have a lot to cover. Uh, so I guess I'll start off with my first one. And I'm kind of cheating here, but my first two are technically uh, a tied deal. Because you can't have one without the other. Uh, both of these came from writers Robert Block and Harlan Ellison. Uh, the first one is A Toy for Juliet. And the second is The Prowler in the City at the Edge of the World. And both of these stories can be found in Dangerous Visions which I'll put a picture of right here. Now, these two stories <laughs> combined create one of the most fun historical fiction, science fiction, Purge, have you ever seen the Purge movies? Purge-like stories I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's so much fun, it's hard to describe, okay? Uh, but I'll essentially give you a rundown starting with uh, A Toy for Juliet of what you're going to expect with these two. So the first story uh, is essentially about this grandfather who has the ability to time travel in the future because humans have powers of telekinesis, pro astral projection, time travel. You know, they have weird uh, mind powers that old humans <laughs> just don't have, right? And he has this granddaughter who is allowed to get away with murdering men uh, who her own grandfather brings her uh, from the past to the future as, you know, pretty much give her victims because in this future society, everyone's allowed to act immoral and, you know, outside of the law. So you can commit murder or you can do whatever you want and not get punished for it because everybody has equal playing field. Everybody has the same abilities to do revenge on each other uh, if somebody commits murder on a family member they can just kill him for revenge, right? But the reason why the grandfather pretty much brings his granddaughter victims is because she's sick and mentally ill and she's kind of a serial killer, right? So one day he's out traveling in the past and he brings her a victim who he unknowingly doesn't know is Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Jack the Ripper and this girl named Juliet, his granddaughter, end up having an altercation. <laughs> and that bleeds into part two, right? I don't want to spoil what happens there, but it's very great. <laughs> and in part two, it, it takes place in Jack the Ripper's point of view of being transplanted to the future in a society where there's no laws and no rules. 
and he's taken back by this and wants to enjoy it, but before he can, he's taken back to his own time. And while he's back in his own time, he's starting to be plagued by these thoughts that can't escape his brain, and he's having a hard time, you know, struggling to uh, cope with these as he's trying to do his killings and whatnot in his normal day-to-day -day life. And it comes to head near the end of the story where he, ex he gets transplanted back to the future, and it's revealed that future denizens <laughs> uh, have targeted him because he's obviously not a person of the future, and two, because they understand of who this man really is and know who he is, and they try to put some conscience into his brain, and he just doesn't want to hear about it, and he goes on a killing spree again in the future, and let's just say it wraps up in a metaphorical way uh, for what's going to become of Jack the Ripper. Is he going to put this aside, or is he going to be struggling with these inner demons for the rest of his life, wherever he ends up staying for the rest of his life? You know what I mean? It's just a very fun story. Uh, if you want to try these out, you can go read them. Like I said, I put the book uh, as a photo. You can go uh, read these. But I think this would be a fantastic creep show two-parter. Uh, it, it's serious. It, it's it's about a historical figure like Jack the Ripper. The reason why you're able to do a killer like him is because they never found out who he really was. So he's more of like a, a mythical uh, being at this point. Um, he did kill real people, which is understandable. But that presence, him being like the first real serial killer, or I guess I guess in the modern definition, uh, is a fun way to present some historical fiction to the franchise. And uh, I'm a sucker for that stuff. <laughs> so um, that's why I would love to see those two stories. And I think it'd be done very well. if They got the right actors. They got some good effects on like the telekinesis powers and all that. And they were able to build the tension like these stories have. Okay. All right. So now we're going to kind of all over the place. Uh, I guess we'll go here because these are pretty much my gimme three uh, I've already talked about these in my Unmade Tales from the Dark Side 2 script stories. I read them all and I gave my thoughts on them. Uh, all three of these stories were supposed to be in that movie. And since they never got made, and since George Romero handpicked them, to essentially being a, being, to be in a movie that was supposed to be a spiritual successor to the first two Creepshow movies and Tales from the Dark Side the movie, and be an unofficial Creepshow 4... I thought, why not make them into the Creepshow franchise officially, at least in the TV show, because the likelihood of us getting a movie at this point doesn't seem all that unreasonable, but not likely, because they haven't really mentioned anything about it. So, uh, those three stories, we'll get, I guess we'll start off with the first one, uh, is Almost Human. This was another story by Robert Block. This is the oldest one on this list, mind you. I think this one goes back to the early 1900s. Uh, this, this has been featured in various publications, but I'll pull up Invasion of the Robots uh, as like an easily accessible one if you want to go uh, try to read the story. So Almost Human uh, is it's a cautionary tale. Uh, it's about humans and their creations. It has a, a lot of tropes with robot stories and science fiction, but there's a fun angle to it uh, with some carnage and some comeuppance to it. Uh, and a shocking ending that I think most people would love. And it fits right at home with the Creepshow franchise just as much as it does with the Tales from the Dark Side franchise. Uh, but the story is essentially about this um, peddler man. Uh, he is out for a score. And uh, he visits this uh, house of a scientist who is rumored to have this uh, groundbreaking invention of a robot. And the man wants access to the robot just to, you know, you know taint it and teach it what, it, what he knows... So he can pretty much have the robot as a get-out-of-jail-free card to get out of all of his debts and the people that he uh, is subservient to. So he can pretty much have a ticket to a new life. And he has a, an accomplice that has gotten close to the scientist to make this process easier. And he manages to uh, take the robot along with his accomplice out to go handle <coughs> all of his enemies before he gets to go and the robot does some grisly things to people but in the process the robot is also struggling with it understanding that it's an artificial presence but also because it has the capability of understanding human emotion tries to 
identify with its humanity that's programmed within it. And it, there's some thought-provoking stuff, right? Um, as schlocky as it can be, it's very entertaining. And I think a lot of people would dig the story. Now, I think it would be completely contingent on the design of the robot. If it looks goofy, I think a lot of people would be taken out by, uh, taken out of the story. But this would be a shoe in uh, the second story is a story by Stephen King, and it's called Rainy Season. Uh, this was featured in Nightmares and Dreamscapes, which I'll put here. And as of recent, Rainy Season had a fan-made movie. Uh, I don't know if they would entertain making it now, because somebody made a film of it already, I guess. But <clears throat> I do think that because it was a fan-made one, that they still could do it. Uh, but this story is one of my favorites <laughs> uh, out of all the stuff I've touched on that's remotely tied to Creepshow. It's fantastic, and I, I dig the premise of it. It's a it's an urban legend type story with a creature feature note, and it's so unique and riveting. And it's it it, it kind of uh, explores two different personality types uh, who happen to be in a couple. All right, so. Uh, it's about this couple who I think are honeymooning and they go to this town that they think is going to be this romantic getaway, but it ends up being like this ghost town with nothing there and they realize they got swindled, but they've already paid money and they have to make the best of it. Uh, and after interacting with, you know, a kind couple, the couple tries to tell them about this uh, omen that's coming, this rain that's going to be raining pretty much poisonous sludge frogs or toads out of the sky and they like to eat things and destroy things and it's best if they leave town now before it's too late and the couple's like yeah 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 you're just pulling our chain uh one one of the couple believes in it the other just scoffs at it and you see that turmoil in the story as they head to their cabin and then they realize if the this nice old couple was telling the truth or not and they have a harrowing night <laughs> dealing with these uh creatures and there's a recontextualization near the end to kind of uh, put into perspective of what this really meant in the grand scheme of it all. This is a is a layered story. It's more of a character study, um, but I think this would be a very riveting story to put in the show. I think people would love it. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> and then the last one uh, for this little section here, I think this is the fifth story overall I'm talking about. Uh, this is Pinfall. This was a story I, I think co-written, I think it was mainly written by Stephen King, but George Romero did adapt it to the screenplay, and I think he did help with the treatment, so I think they, they, they both count here. This only exists in comic form, in like at least in ma mass-produced quantity, so I'll put the comic here. Um, but really, this was an unused script story made for the Creepshow 2 movie that was also going to end up in, be, uh, end up in Tales from the Dark Side 2, that never happened. Uh, and years later, because it was the only story from the original Creepshow 2 script that never got made, uh, somebody made it into a comic. Now the reason why I want to see this one made in the TV show is simply because we would finally have the story made. Uh, but with that, with that being aside, it, it's a textbook Creepshow story through and through. Uh, the premise is about these two rival bowling teams are bowling one night. They, they're led by these two pompous dicks who are very competitive. One team ends up befriending this very elderly gentleman who they don't know has a lot of money, but it ends up kind of benefiting them later on because after they are playing a game with the old man, he ends up dying a pretty graphic death. And they learn later on uh, through his will and testament that he's bequeathed millions of dollars as a prize to the next bowling tournament winner to the team who ends up winning the tournament. And... The two get to practicing, one team gets overzealous and kind of jealous of the other team's, you know, skill and acumen and tries to sabotage them, but it ends up backfiring in a bad way, uh, but also kind of a good way for them to have a better outcome. But because of this choice they made, now they're, because it's Creepshow, are going to have to suffer the wrath of their decisions, and it goes very schlocky very quick, and let's just say it's bowling alley shenanigans going on in the back half of the story uh yeah this one would be an absolute fun episode to do through and through i really have nothing else to say 
Uh, pure creep show. Absolute pure creep show. All right, I guess I'll go ahead and mention uh, uh, two Stephen King stories and another Joe Hill story um, before we get into the last round, which are, I guess, the stories not from them, too. <laughs> uh, but we can start off here. Uh, and at number six, we have a story called The Monkey. Uh, this is by Stephen King. It was featured in Skeleton Crew, which I'll put an image of here. Now, this story might be boring to some people. I can totally understand. It's a simple omen tale. You've kind of been there, done that with it. But the monster is what I like here. And if you're able to make the monster's presence on camera even and not annoying, if you're able to have good acting, and if you're able to build the tension of this story very well, you'll actually have a pretty solid, you know, 3.5, maybe to a 4 star t episode on your hands. In my opinion. Uh, but it's, it's it's a simple premise. This man, he's been cursed uh, historically throughout his family's lineage uh, of this monkey that has these clacking symbols. And every time the monkey clacks its symbols, one of his family members dies. And the man, you know, at first doesn't really realize this, but he comes to grips that this is what's happening. And he has to deal with this monkey uh, as the monkey is causing these grisly deaths. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever seen the, the urban legend, uh, what is it, the Busby's Chair or Busby's Stoop, it's a, it's a urban legend from England that anybody who sits in the chair ends up dying shortly thereafter. That's essentially what the story's kind of replicating. Um, now, there are some twists from the short stories, uh, from the short story itself that I think you can tweak and make it more interesting for the episode adaptation, but other than that... Um, there's a nod to a lake called Crystal Lake. If they really wanted to, they could throw some Jason Voorhees cameos <laughs> in this episode, and I think a lot of people would love it. Um, there's a lot of potential with it. As long as they make it make it with quality and care, this one won't be as boring as it probably could be. But I throw it here because it's one of the actual stories that King has writ written that's not option for a movie and I don't think has been made in anything else in previous years that could fit. So that's why it's here. Um, all right. And at number seven, uh, we have a story, uh, also by Stephen King and it's called, I am the doorway. And this story was featured in night shift, which I'll put a photo of right here. Uh, this story is very HP Lovecraftian in all the best ways possible. This is like a cosmic horror story done with an ethical approach i think there's a lot of um subtext and layers to peel back with a story great body horror imagery in the short story itself that if you're able to capture it on screen it could be some visually stunning shit <coughs> it could possibly actually scare people um but as the premise is an astronaut who had just returned from an expedition to venus has this grisly stuff happening to his body. And as he learns throughout the story, because I, I, I really can't go any further than what I'm going without spoiling, spoiling it completely. But let's just say this stuff starts happening to his body that insinuates that what happened on Venus has a consequence with him on Earth and he's potentially become a vessel between both worlds. And it is pretty graphic <laughs> uh this would be a sight to behold if they're able to actually have um i don't know a believable actor behind the role uh some good i guess green screen effects or cgi would probably be needed the fact that they made the right snuff and made that look aesthetically decent i think they can pull this one off if they really wanted to um like i said they just need to put a little tlc into it and it'll be fine and, uh, all right, so that wraps up the Stephen King ones. And the Joe Hill story, I think at number eight, we have a story called Dark Carousel. This was from Full Throttle, and I'll put a picture right here. Full Throttle's had three stories so far in the Creepshow series adapted. I think there was By the Silver Waters of Lake Champlain, there was Twittering from the Circus of the Dead, and there was Mums. This is the last one of that short story collection that I want to see done. 
I like the idea in the in the setting of the story. It's a carnival meets a haunted object story. <laughs> and I'm a sucker for haunted object stories. And the monster are legit carousel horses. Uh, but essentially the premise is four college students who are on different paths in life decide to have a get together as friends at this local carnival of theirs. And they are having fun and they come across this carousel with this eerie carousel operator and they learn some backstory behind this carousel. Maybe some parts are from a ride with a tragic past. And they learned the grisly truth <laughs> behind it all once these horses from this carousel make their presence known. <laughs> and they might be after these kids. <laughs> it is kind of terrifying. I, I just want to see this one done because of the, like I said, the setting and the aesthetic to it. Um, and it it's actually has some pretty good emotions about friends about to part and go different ways in their life. Um, I, I like the themes to it. I think this would have a more deeper a message to it while also providing that schlock that creep is known for this would be a creep show movie tier story i would recommend uh but like i said since i don't think that they're going to be doing a movie anytime soon these are the ones i'll recommend okay <laughs> all right so there's that all right now the final four are are the ones that are not ones that you would naturally think of these are probably most, for the most part, stories you never even heard of. <laughs> but these are ones that I found um, that I just agree with, uh, either with people online that I've taken recommendations of or ones that i found that I think would be absolutely great. Now, uh, my number nine is one that I found on a list, on a blog post, as the person's number one story they want to see adapted. And I checked it out, and I read it, and I was like, wow, this actually would be fantastic in the Creep Show series, so I, I absolutely 100% agree with them. And it's a story, a, a story by Nadia Bulkin, and it's called Absolute Zero, and it was um, featured in Creatures: Thirty Years of Monsters. <coughs> now, this story has a lot of emotional weight to it. It has a has a theme of self discovery in it. It has some it has a very grisly final final third of the story that I think would definitely wow people. Uh, if they're able to have a, a creepy monster design going for this story, this honestly could be considered a masterpiece in the series if they were able to do it correctly. Uh, but I just really love the idea of this. So um, the main character at a young age discovers through conversations with their mother and finding a photo of their father that their father wasn't really human. <laughs> it might be this grotesque woodland monster of like folktale legend. And throughout their adolescence into their teenage and early adult life, they've had to struggle with A, not being able to interact with their own father, but also kind of struggling with their uh, non-fully human identity, right? And it comes to fruition when they get older, when they have a girlfriend, I think, and they learn of the whereabouts of their father, who might be holding their father, and <laughs> like I said, it goes batshit in the final act. Um, I don't want to spoil where the father's at, but it's it's a fun aesthetic. It's kind of similar to a carnival, uh, but I'll leave it at that. It, it just ends on a wild note, <laughs> and, and on a more happier note than you usually see. But I, I, I do think that this story has a lot of uh, themes and, and subtext to pull back that uh, feel reminiscent to movie quality creep show stories. And that's really what I'm trying to look for for the most part when I'm picking these short stories. Um, this one is chilling. It, it really is chilling uh, and it's very relatable. I think it's more universal than most of these stories are inherently. So um, yeah, definitely recommend that one. Now at number 10... <laughs> This story would be definitely prodding at controversy, and I'd be shocked if they actually took the story verbatim from the sh uh, from the text and tried to adapt it onto screen. They would have to adjust some dialogue because this was written in the early '90s, post the '80s AIDS epidemic going into the early '90s, which was still a you know evident issue. 
But aside from that, this story is really fucking chilling. I mean, this is one of the stories, whenever I think about this, I have to think about it from start to finish because just how shocking it was and how different it feels from every other horror, horror short story I've ever read. And it's uh, by this writer called S.P. Sumtow. And it's called Chui Chai. It's translated to Transformation Song. Uh, and it's featured in the Ultimate Frankenstein uh, collection, which I'll put a fi uh, picture of here. This is essentially a time period piece. Like I said, it's talking about the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and the early 1990s. And it, was, it came out in 1991. So you have to understand that this was written from the perspective of somebody who I think is kind of like known... Uh, the author, like, knew a lot of people that were affected by it. So, I, I think this is, uh, I, I can definitely feel the emotion and the power in the story. But it's also a very thought-provoking story at the same time. This one reminds me a lot of controversial topics like the crate covered, but even more pervasive and in your face. And just hear me out on the premise here, because it, it, it's very different. So this man, he is uh, a businessman. And he's over in Thailand. Uh, you know, he's a single guy at the time, at the beginning of the story. He's, he, let's just say he's a night owl and he likes to frequent gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> and he comes across this beautiful woman. And he's mesmerized by her. She does this transformation song uh, and dances along with him. And pretty much intoxicates him to the point where he just gives in to his lust and makes love to her. Well, shortly after, the woman disappears from his life. Uh, there's another character involved in the story, but if I mention anything about this character, it will definitely spoil the back half. But let's just say this character is in and out of this story in the first in the first act, the second act, and the third act. And plays a pivotal role, and especially in the final act of the story. But the man, you know, after that encounter, he ends up contracting AIDS, right? Uh, but he still finds way uh, finds a way to live a normal life. He meets his wife, uh, who he ends up marrying. He has kids, but uh, he doesn't really love his wife. He's in love with this woman that gave him AIDS, and which is kind of weird to think about. But he he really does love her. He loves his kids too, but he uh, realizes that their best shot of education is ship, shipping them off to private school. So that's what he does, and he's very self centered. Right, but that's just because he's he's struggling to find happiness. He goes to a support group, uh, who are are also you know AIDS survivors, and he's talking with them. And one of them ends up convincing him to divorce his wife and try to find happiness for himself. So he does so, and he goes back to Thailand to try to find this woman that he made love with all those years ago that gave him AIDS. But it goes fucking bizarre <laughs> from here. It goes from zero to one eighty real quick. A bunch of recontextualization moments happen, especially with this character that you meet in the first act of the story. Um, when he goes back to Thailand, he's trying to find the whereabouts of this woman. And there's some grisly, bizarre, body horror shit going on. Maybe some mind fuckery going on with the main character. He doesn't know what to believe. He doesn't know what the hell's going on. Uh, and then the final act reveals it all in one big fell swoop of what's been actually going on since the time he met this woman years ago up until now what he's been witnessing since he's been back in Thailand, and what the nature of this all is. It's fucking warped. And then the ending <laughs> is so weird and bizarre, <laughs> I kind of want to see it expanded on, because it's kind of ambiguous, but holy shit. <laughs> um, yeah, there's uh, th th there's some obvious commentary, kind of on-the-nose commentary, about um, the perceptions about uh, you know prostitutes and the people of the streets and... Uh, like I said, it was made in the 80s or 90s. If you were to adapt this story, it would have to be set in that time to make thematic sense. If it was set in modern times, I don't think it would register the same. You would have to go out of your way to say 1980s as the setting of the uh, uh, of the beginning of the story. But other than that, this is just fucking sh schlocky near the end, and it's thought-provoking as shit. It gets emotional deep. It's very different, like I said. If you heard the premise and you want to try it out... Go try it out, because it, it is fucking bizarre. <laughs> I think about this one a lot. All right, in the last two at 11 and 12 are actually comic stories. Um, so, yeah, um, at my number 11, 
We have a story by Bruce Jones who did All Hallows Eve from season one. And he also um, did this story here. Uh, it came from the same comic series that that story was taken from. It, it was called um, Twisted Tales. And the story I'm talking about is Night Watch. And this story specifically comes in Twisted Tales number two, which I'll put a picture of right here. And Night Watch is just a fun schlocky story <laughs> this is just a pure fun one this it's not too much deep stuff going on but it is a time period piece i think it's supposed to take place in either the korean or vietnamese war something like that um these this group of soldiers are you know toughing out this terrain um throughout this long drawn out war and at night time they have to maneuver this threat of giant mutant rats <laughs> And these rats mercilessly kill these soldiers in graphic fashion. And these soldiers realize that they're going to be running out of ammunition soon. They need to make it to um, the next you know, destination, meet up with uh, their help so they can handle the, the enemy. The enemy is far worse than they anticipated. And then they start to kind of question, wait, why are we fighting rats? And they, it kind of goes this meta route where like they're becoming self-aware of the situation like, hey... Why are we fighting humans? Why are we fighting rats? You know, there's something weird going on here. And then the ending <laughs> definitely recontextualizes what the hell has been going on. Why rats are fighting humans in a meta fashion. But it's done very well. And it's actually a fucking dark meta ending. <laughs> what happens to these soldiers? I'll just leave it at that. Um, it's super entertaining. You know, I know we already had a soldier-based story. I know the trope of soldier stories have been done. Monsters had an episode. Tales from the Crypt had an episode. We've already seen one in Creepshow. But this would be a fun one. If we're going to do one last one, do this. <laughs> this would be fucking awesome. Alright? Just say it. And at my number 12, my last story I want to see done uh, in the Creepshow TV show is another comic story. This one was done by George Cashton. And it is called Death is the Prize. Now, this story was featured in a DC comic called Unexpected, and it's issue number 177, and I'll leave the picture of it right here. Now, this story is the most simple, straightforward out of all of them, but it's also the one where you can add a lot of things to flesh out the story and actually very, very much improve on it than, than what the comic gave and add on to the ending, for example, and just make it very memorable. This has a very standout aesthetic to it that I want to see done. Uh, tremendously so. And I think that if you had a good monster design, a good set design, and some good actors, this could be a fan favorite. Just saying. Throwing that out there. Uh, but the, the story is about uh, uh, these two business partners. Uh, the main character, though, is a man who is kind of salty at his business partner uh, and has you know a bad history of being in business with him. I think they run a general store slash candy store and he's tired of being in business with the guy and the only stipulation that he has to get to get out of this contract with him is to essentially have the man die. So he comes up with a scheme with a scientist who he recruits to help him to get rid of this man and they come up with a scheme that uh, they, they'll put a specific concoction into uh, a piece of candy and give it to his uh, business partner's son. And this business, uh, and the son will essentially become an inhuman creature and handle his own father. So that way they can't really, the authorities can't blame the man for what happened because it's obvious the son turned into a monster and killed his own father. Well, let's just say... Things don't go as expected for them. But let's just say there's a plot twist involved around the middle portion of the story. Um, and there's a comeuppance angle <laughs> involved with these two guys trying to, you know, commit a conspiracy for murder. Or, I guess, assassination. Uh, <laughs> but where the ending of the comic story kind of is ambiguous, I think they can easily add on to it and make it a really fucked up grizzly sight to behold uh and maybe do a, a mini addition to it and to see what the aftermath of it all is um if not if they want to end on a stinger that's fine uh, but this is just 
textbook creep show like stuff i mean this would work it might be, not be the most original thing ever it might not be the greatest thing ever but damn if i say it like i said if you have a good monster design you can really knock this out of the park now there's a story where you build up to the monster reveal near the end but dare i say it's entertaining and i think the, the plot and the drama structure could definitely carry a majority of the episode if they're able to play it up good so those are my 12 stories i want to see adapted in the creep show television series like i said early on let me know down in the comment section what stories would you want to see adapted in the tv show uh do you agree with some of my picks do you disagree um let me know i'm dying to hear from what you had to say i'll see you next time